this series, which will enable other players to improve their chess. The methodology behind this will be going through my own games, both the wins and the losses. And the idea is that as I annotate these games, younger players, weaker players will be able to test themselves and try and find the better moves in the game, find things I missed, or perhaps just to enjoy a good club game being played. The other side of that is that hopefully stronger players out there will be able to look at my annotations and tell me exactly what I'm doing wrong. I'm getting better as a player now myself, I've been playing for about half my life, so 14 years, and my next grade in the English Chess Federation list should be about 152. So for those of you outside of England, that's roughly a class A player. The game we're going to look at today is from the Tyndale League, which is a very friendly, small little league in Cumbria. And this was played a couple of weeks ago against my friend Dave Foster. His grade is 117, and at the moment mine is 130. So that's roughly 1600, 1700 territory. And the game was played at 90 minutes each for all moves. So White kicks off with e4, which was a pleasant surprise because I've been expecting to play somebody who played d4, which would have been more difficult, not quite suiting my style. e5 in response. And after knight to f3, knight to f6, we have a Petrov. Now, a fair few people in Cumbria have had this as white against me, and there are a number of options. White can play knight c3 as he does in the game. Alternatively, if he wants to go for something sharper, he can play bishop to c4, when black has the option of taking on e4, or playing knight c6 going back into the two knights. Dropping back, white can also play technically with d4, and we'll see a game later on when I played in the British Chess Championships, where white played in exactly this way. If he wants to be a bit cagey, he could play a3, but knight c3 was played. And interestingly enough, black plays bishop to b4, which is not the first obvious move most people might play knight c6, but it's perfectly good, and we're creating some imbalance already. What you may already notice is that this is a very similar position to that of the Spanish or Roy Lopez. Difference being that white has his extra knight on f3 here. With that in mind, the main line here would be actually take on e5. And then white basically gets a Berlin Spanish with an extra tempo, so it could be castles, bishop to e2, rook e8, knight to d3, just keeping room for that bishop to expand, bishop takes, d takes, and knight takes e4. And it's an imbalanced game, but it's equal. Again, white has a number of choices here. He can play a3 in the vein of the Spanish which, given black is behind in tempi, forces the exchange on c3 again. And after d takes c3, the pawn on e5 really is under threat. Of course, we can't take here, because queen to d5 is quite nasty. So instead we would play d6, and bishop g5 would be one option. White can still play bishop to c4. He could play knight d5, which is possible but quite rare. And he could even play bishop to d3, but we've got a series later on where I'll go into that move in more depth, because I've had a few games with that recently myself. Instead of all of those moves, white plays d3, taking us into reverse Steinitz territory after d5. Now here's the first question for those of you who are improving. Can white take on e5 now? Pause the video and have a think. Okay, if you said that white can take on e5 now, dock yourself many points. Because knight takes e5 allows a fork. If black advances his pawn to d4, then the knight has nowhere to move. So the best thing white can do is to counter challenge the bishop on b4. But since the knight on e5 is already unprotected, the simple bishop to d6 leaves us a piece up. Given this, white did not play bishop knight takes e5, sorry. He could play bishop to d2, which is what he played Dave actually in our last game a couple of years ago, and this would be a better move than what was played in the game actually. After knight c6, he played h3, which was a bit slow. A castle, a3 again, a slow move. And after bishop takes, bishop takes, black took on e4 and was already fine. Instead, we're going to look at what happened after 5a3, immediately putting the question to this bishop. So we have no choice to take again, because we're tempi behind here. Bishop takes c3, check, b takes c3, and knight c6. If you're wondering why black 
doesn't take on e4. The reason is simply that after knight takes e5, white has a good knight on e5. And with an imbalanced pawn structure and two bishops, he has plenty of things to be happy about. By contrast, after knight c6, having lost tempo with a3, the best thing he would do would be to take on d5 and try and kick me away. And still there's something to play for here. Instead of that though, after knight c6, white deliberately gambits the e-pawn with bishop to g5, trying to exploit this pin on the diagonal here. The problem with this is that white has no control of an auxiliary square on e4 or d5 to amplify this pressure. So although e takes d5 is a sort of threat, we simply take ourselves. And now already white has an unpleasant choice. If he chooses to take on f6, then after queen takes, d takes, black is very comfortable if not already better. After bishop to e6, we're going to be first to the open d-file, and we have a better pawn structure with no weaknesses, note that e5 is nicely defended, and we also have a nagging lead in meaningful development with a potential control point on c4 for either a bishop or a knight. And given this, it's no surprise that white just chopped on e4 straight away. However, after queen takes d1, rook takes d1, let's just go through it again, queen takes, rook takes, knight takes e4, black wins a pawn for his sins, and white is now forced into some very angry business. So, white plays bishop to b5, and this hopes that white will go lost, you know, black hasn't got much development here. And next question is what happens if black takes on c3? Okay, if you wanted to take on c3, again, dock many points. Bishop takes c6 would be a nasty surprise here. We're in check, so we can't take the rook. And if we take back the bishop, rook d8 is a rather nasty checkmate. Accordingly, instead, the only other thing we could do would be to play bishop to d7. But once we do that, white can simply recapture, and he's going to be at least one piece up. Black does, however, have many choices in this position. So, here is where I'd like some input from stronger players. Pause the video and see what you would play here. Give yourselves perhaps 10 20 minutes if you need it, and have a think about your options. Okay, the first thing to cover here is that, as far as I'm concerned, positionally, knight takes g5 is quite a mistake. Now, it may still be a perfectly playable line, but the bishop on g5, if we look at it objectively, is doing nothing. He is auxiliary controlling d8, but he's not attacking anything in our position. If we take, and after knight takes g5, then white is going to be very quickly able to bring his knight straight to e4, which is a very nice square indeed. We've also given up our better knight, so I don't think this is something we should be playing. We do have the option of bringing the knight back straight away, putting the question to this bishop on b5. However, after knight takes e5, knight takes b5, knight c6, bishop to d7, white has not quite got such a material problem as he did in the game, and over the board this is not going to be quite as comfortable for us. We could play the very sharp f6, and at first it looks like this simply rebuffs white's attack. Now there's a lot of tactics in this line, so if you did consider this, then it's quite possible you might have got stuck somewhere, because I certainly did. In the game, I looked at a few lines, primarily starting with bishop takes c6, removing the guard of the e5 pawn. So b takes c6, and knight takes e5. And at the moment it looks as though white has restored the material balance. We have a few options. We could take on e5, but this looked a bit painful for me. After rook to d8 check, king f7, rook takes d8. Knight takes g5, castles, bishop to b7 to clear out the problem with the rook, and rook takes, bishop takes, and objectively when we're looking at it this is perfectly safe, but I would say this is a horrible position for black to have an advantage in, 
if this was being played, for example, between somebody rated 150 against somebody rated 210, then this is not going to be easy at all. We have three islands of weak isolated pawns, even double pawns, and we have a bishop and a knight which are poorly coordinated against a rook. So I didn't want to play this long. If instead we play f takes g5, things aren't quite as good even, because knight takes c6 comes. And while it's true that black can just play bishop to d7, cutting out the threat of rook d8 check, knight to e5, rook to d8, rook to d3, rook f8, I didn't quite see this far in the game. As it turns out, after knight takes e5, the simplest way of doing things is probably knight takes c3, when there are simply too many pieces on prees for white to be able to get anything back. So one line would be rook to d3, knight to e4, rook to e3, knight takes g5, knight g6, king f7, knight takes, and king f8, when the knight is trapped. But again, this isn't something that we necessarily want to go into. We want a safe, stable advantage. There was another line where white could instead take on e5 straight away. And again, in the game I had a lot of stuff to look at here. If f takes e5 now, rook d8 check, king comes across, we take, we take, but now with the extra bishop, white can play bishop to c4. And he's got good compensation here. We don't want two knights against the rook, we'd rather have two bishops or a knight and a bishop. So instead of that, if we try f takes g5, white can take on c6, and after b takes c6, bishop takes c6, we're in a world of pain. Again, it turns out that the best move is simply to take on c3, and there are too many things on prees. Bishop takes c6, b takes c6, transposing. If you saw any proportion of that, then well done. And if you saw that the best move is castling, then well done. As far as I'm concerned, this is a perfectly good move. Black brings the king into safety, develops his rook, going to get to the open d-file or e-file soon, and now, more tellingly, the threat to this c-pawn is very real, must be dealt with at once. So white swallows his pride and makes an excellent move. He plays bishop to d2, which looks like a mistake because we're moving the bishop again, but the c3 pawn is simply an essential part of the position. If white goes two pawns down, he's not going to have anything. At the moment, he has two bishops which he can work with. It's going to be a good long-term asset for the end game. But black is probably better. We've got this excellent knight on e4, which is the bodyguard of the entire center. We've got a kingside majority of pawns, which we can start pushing later on. We've got an outpost on c5, strong square there. And, yeah, this is just a really good position. So, white is going to have to fight very hard now. The only other thing he could try would be to set some traps with bishop takes c6, and after b takes, bishop to e7. Looks very pretty, but after rook to e8, if white tries to smash down the centre with rook d8, we can simply develop with tempo, and keep our rooks guard. And this is known as x-ray defence. One piece guards another through an attacking piece. Rook takes, bishop takes, and black will be fine. So in the game we have two real choices here, I felt. Rook to e8 is possible, just strengthening the centre. But after castles, I analysed knight takes d2. Knight takes d2, which to me was clearly better than rook takes, because after bishop f5, bishop to d3 is now possible. Note that if the knight was here and the rook was there, e4 would be playable. e4, bishop b5, e3, f takes e3, shattering white's pawns, bishop takes, and rook d to e1. But white's minor pieces seem able to find employment here. It struck me that if this had been a long game in a PM open style time control, maybe a 6-7 hour game, this would be perfectly good to play. But I don't want to be giving white anything in this game. I want to keep a hammerlock on the position, and I want to play absolutely core positional chess. So, Knight to d6 was played, and I think this is very accurate. The bishop on d2 
is basically just a giant doorstop at the moment. The D file is blocked, so the rook is not doing anything. The knight has nowhere to go. And the bishop is being forced to give up its comfy by diagonal lifestyle. And I think this is where white begins to lose the thread of the game. He takes on c6, but this loses the last major imbalance that he can use in the game. If instead he plays, for example, bishop to a4, it does look as though white is going to be in trouble after a move like knight to a5, because the bishop is going to be trapped after knight a to c4. But do note that then black's knights are on the same path, and we're using two pieces to hem one in. So it's not quite that bad. In the game I was looking at bishop to e2, but perhaps knight to f5 is a little bit more telling then. When white takes on c6, he's going to have a lot of difficulty finding employment of these pieces. He's got a static weakness on the c4 square, which is going to be occupied soon. We've got opposite club bishops, which means that since black has the better position, he can have the initiative with almost an extra half piece. And, in fact, I wager that I could probably beat the computer at 2200 rating from this position. And we'll get to the results of that later on. So, in the game, white castles. Which looks normal enough. But his problems begin to show after knight c4. He's simply got nowhere to go. Bishop to e3 is a good idea. You have to try and improve your minor pieces all the time. Bishop f5 came up, eyeing this weak c2 pawn. Best then would be knight to e1, which looks very ugly, but white simply cannot afford to be two pawns down. Instead, rook f e1 was tried. Crunch goes the pawn, rook to d7, which is something Dave was also happy with, but now comes rook a to c8. Just dropping back for a moment, rook f to c8 is perfectly possible as well, but in this game I wanted to emphasise activity for all my pieces and I didn't want the rook rotting away babysitting a weak pawn on a7. After bishop takes a7, black continues to solidify his central structure with f6. Note that this bishop is going to have a lot of difficulty now getting anywhere, so he comes to the only place he can on c5. Note also that the knight on f3 is still frozen out of the game thanks to this excellent knight on c4. If white could simply exchange these two pieces, he would already have some relief. With opposite coloured bishops, white could try and engineer chances to exchange the rooks and weaken the structure of black's pawns a bit, and then try and get a draw. Rook f to d8 came, allowing absolutely no control of a d-file. And after rook takes, rook takes, rook c1, black is pretty much on his way to achieving everything he ever wanted. The bishop, by the way, is immune to capture because of rook to d1, which is going to be made. And with that in mind, black just improves the position of his last piece with rook to d5. Bishop to a7 was played, hoping to try and come round the back of this weak c7 pawn. And now came quite a big turning point. Black should simply carry on eating pawns with knight takes a3. With only one pair of rooks, black's active and white's passive, there is no danger of removal of the guard these two pieces. It looks like the knight is hanging in the air defending the bishop, but there's still the problem with the mate on the back rank. Instead, black played c5. Can you see why that's a mistake? Well, bishop takes c5 would be a shocker. Rook takes c5, rook takes c2, and although black remains a pawn up, this is very difficult indeed. So it was very fortunate for me that white missed this and played h4, trying simply to clamp down on the scope of this diagonal bishop. Bishop to g6, however, simply cutting the idea out. h5 would be possible because it's actually better to come back to e4 than take on h5 and allow rook b1. But after rook to b1 now, the game was over, unfortunately. The pressure simply got to Dove which was unfortunate because he played a very strong game. He played very good positional ideas. But the problem was that after knight d6 takes takes, he was simply too slow. So when I fed this position to my Houdini, 
it suggested the immediate bishop to e3. And it's reasonably clear to say that this was the right idea. We simply have to get these minor pieces active and stop black doing much. So one option here would be just to solidify the pawn chain with f6. Bishop c5, rook to d8. Bishop takes c takes knight d2. Another alternative would be simply to protect the e-pawn with the rook, avoiding any sort of problem after bishop c5. And then we could play knight to b7 and force the bishop back. If we simply come in c4 straight away, this allows bishop to c5, rook e8, knight to d2, and white is finally organising these minor pieces at long last. So, the lesson in this game is that you have to keep coordinating your minor pieces as long as you want. All through the game, black simply has better mobility. This knight on e4 basically won him the game. White was very mature in playing bishop to d2 and realising that he had to move back. But when it came to the crunch position here, he was simply too slow. Okay, so that's the end of that game. If you enjoyed that video, please do let me know. This is the first video I've ever done, so the quality may be appalling. If there's anything you think I've missed, do let me know. If there's any variations you wanted to see, then just ask. Send me a message.